average and instantaneous speed. So most of you drove here or rode a bicycle or walked, but either way, no matter how you got here, you had some speed at different times. Probably started at zero while you were sleeping and then increase your speed and then uh, at some point you sat down in a chair and your speed's back at zero. Now, <coughs> if we look at your average speed during your trip to get here, we could basically compute your mileage and your time, calculate those two and divide them. So we'll start out talking about average first. So average speed We're going to do average speed. We're going to get distance traveled divided by time. And this distance over time is our uh, average speed. You can see this in the units that we use. So either way, when we measure speed, typical units, what are the units you see most of the time? Miles per hour. So that's our standard units. Miles per hour. And sometimes we just write MPH, where that P is basically the divide miles by hours. So that's for typical units, miles per hour. You can have any distance divided by any time. So depending on what you're measuring, sometimes there's feet per second or meters per second or some other units. But typically, it's miles per hour. No matter what, it's distance units divided by time units. So no matter what, you're going to get distance divided by time. So we do average speed, distance traveled divided by time. If we have a function, so I could write delta y over delta t, and what in the world is this weird triangle? So it's a Greek letter delta, and it means the change in. So it tells you how much y is changing and how much t is changing. And typically, this is going to be y1 minus y0 divided by t1 minus t0. So it's final y position minus initial divided by final time minus start time. And you've probably done this by looking at your clock and saying, oh, I went three minutes and counted the milepost you go past. And you can do a really simple estimation that way. So all you're doing is calculating what milepost am I at? What one did I look at when I started? And subtracting. Oh, I went three or four miles. You subtract the two. <laughs> Same thing with the time. Look at your time at the end. Subtract the time when you started. So you've probably done all these calculations before at least you've estimated them. So delta is change. So we got change in y divided by change in time. Now if you have a position function, And that's y equals f of t. So at different times, we're at a different position. Then y1 is going to be f of t1. This is your final time, final position. And your initial will be y0 equals f of t0. So your final time, your initial time, you just f those two values, and you get your position. Now, if I change t's into x's, if I just change the letter from t to x, what is average speed? If you look at this equation, what does that look like? Slope. So we're not doing anything different than finding slope. So 
So I could write this equals slope from, <coughs> so it's between two points, and the two points are, we'll go initial one first, we'll go y0, t0, to the point y1, t1. So all we're doing is looking at slope between two points right here. So we got our initial point, y0, t0, and our final point, y1, t1. And we could, of course, go in. Oh, I put them backwards. Yeah, yeah, Yep. So I should put the t's first and the y second. Absolutely. So we got t from t0, y0 to t1, y1. And of course, if I use function notation, it's t0, f of t0, and the other one, t1, f of t1. So we're just getting average rate of change between two different points. That's all. So if we're going to pick one of these to circle, I'll rewrite the average rate of change. So if we go average rate of change in y for x between a and b, so this average rate of change is just fb minus fa over b minus a. So we'll go with that one. You could, if you wanted to, write it like this. This is exactly the same. What is the difference between FB minus FA over B minus A and the second one I wrote down? They're pretty similar. Both fractions, they got all the same four terms. All that happened is make the numerator and denominator negative. And the plus becomes a minus, minus a plus, and you can change the order. So as long as you keep the orders the same, technically it doesn't matter if A goes first or B goes first. That being said, do the one that's in the box right there. So it doesn't matter the order, but you can screw it up if you go FB minus FA, A minus B. That's not the same thing. If you swap one of the two, and not both. So that will not work. So we'll stick with the uh, rate of change there in the box. And let's do an example now. So we're going to be given a function we'll go with 16 t squared. This is the free fall equation in feet per second. So if you know how many seconds after uh, an object was dropped, have gone by, you can know how many feet the object has fallen. So this is positive. Uh, we're just going to count the number of feet fallen as positive, even though obviously it's going downwards. So we'll just count all that as positive. You could very easily put a negative in, in front and count all those feet as negative if you want to. So I want to know what is the average speed during the first two seconds.
Now we're dealing with time and it doesn't tell you exactly when it starts. It just says first two seconds, you can assume it starts at zero. So if I don't explicitly say where it starts, on this one it just says first two seconds. In this case it means from zero to two. So we're going to take t to be in the interval 0, 2. Oh, let's use a rock. How about that? That'll be easy. Average rate of change. So we're going to f. 2 minus f0 divided by 2 minus 0. So I just took the rate of change and used the 2 and the 0 for b and a. And now filling in those values, 16, 2 squared minus 16 times 0 over 2. We should get 32 feet. Per second. And if you're a science person and you want units, I did them in blue right there. So your two original functions measure in feet, and then your t values are units or seconds. So this is going to be feet per second. I don't generally make a big deal about units overall, but sometimes when you do calculus, it can be useful because you're going to be dividing by so a lot of times time or some other quantity. All right, so we got average rate change 32 feet per second. Now I want you to find average rate of change for t between 1 and 2. So almost the same problem, just change one of the time values a little bit. So this is during the first, or during the second second, I guess you could say from 1 second to 2 seconds. So it'll be 1 second total, but starting at 1, ending at 2. So do the same process with these t values. So you should have 48 feet per second. So what this tells you it fell faster in the last second of the first two seconds than it did overall in the entire interval. Well, the average speed was faster in the last part of that interval. I also computed the average rate of change from between two and three. So after that interval is done, the next one second, it's going to be going 80 feet per second. Yep. So on the first time, you only squared the first time, but on the second, two, you squared uh, I just probably assumed it was zero in my head and didn't uh, bother squaring it, yeah. So what would happen if I went three to four seconds? If I looked at the average falling speed between three and four seconds? Prediction. 
probably go faster. And five and six, probably go faster. So this is consistent with the idea of something falling goes faster and faster. This equation ignores air resistance. So this is falling in a vacuum. Air resistance isn't a big deal until you're falling quickly. So the first one or two seconds or three seconds, it's not going to be a big deal. There is another question I can ask aside from the average rate of speed, and that is the idea of what's instantaneous rate of speed. So if we actually measured the, not how fast is it falling for an entire second, and subtracting initial and final conditions. But if I want to know exactly at some moment, we're going to look at two seconds, exactly how fast is this falling at two seconds. Yes? Did it show you um, like the terminal speed, too? Like if, well, that's uh, because of air resistance okay. is why you hit terminal velocity. So the only thing slowing a falling object down is, at least in our, uh, the main force that we pay attention to, gravity's pulling down, and air resistance is resisting that, or adding a drag. And the terminal velocity is where your drag is the same as the pull of gravity. Okay. So you're actually, you're not in a static equilibrium, but on the acceleration level, you're in static equilibrium, okay. meaning your velocity is constant. Okay. So yeah. Velocity is another word I haven't said before. <laughs> uh, we'll learn about that later. But it's almost a static equilibrium problem where you're equalizing accelerations, meaning it, the velocity, the speed won't be changing okay. until it's the ground. So we, we can do different average rates of speed, but what we want to do instead right now is find the actual velocity at two seconds. So I know the velocity between one and two, the average is 48, and after two to three, the average is 80. So it makes sense, most likely, the actual instantaneous velocity at two seconds is probably going to be between these two numbers. So this will give us a decent estimate right here. How can we figure out the actual velocity, the actual speed at two seconds? So this is the instantaneous speed. Oh, I said t equals 2 and wrote 0. t equals 2. You could find the initial speed, the instantaneous speed at t equals 0. That's before you drop it. Zero. That's 0. It's a little silly. All right, let's go ahead and graph this function out. It's pretty easy. It is a, let's see, a parabola. It has a very serious vertical stretch on it. So a stretch 16 times as tall as it normally would be. So I'm going to go ahead and graph this function. And it's going to look like this. So I'm going to draw now the computations we made already. We know that rate of change right there from 1 to 2. So I figured out that slope. That was 48. Uh, this is not to scale. Let's see. At 1 second, we were 16. At 2 seconds, we fell 2 seconds. What is f of 2? I never really computed that. Was it 64, it looks like? The next one up at 3 would be a really big number. What, an, what is 9 times 16? Whatever that is. Some big number up there. So, good enough. So we got the slopes of these two dotted lines right here. One of them was 30, no, 48, and the other one was 80. So our hunch is the actual slope's probably in between the two. I can draw a pretty good estimate for the actual slope. I'll do this in green right here. 
the actual slope is going to look something like that. So I'm doing my best to have this green dotted line basically touch the curve at one point. And if I zoom in far enough, this won't let me zoom in that far, the curve actually looks closer to a straight line. And I want to find the equation, or the, at least the slope of this green dotted line right here. So what are some things we can do? We know how to compute average rate of speed. How can I use that average rate of speed and get an estimate that's way better than the two we have? So I'm still going to compute average rate of speed, but I can choose not different function, f, but I can choose different time values. What are, what's a decent interval or two time values to use? I could do four and three, but that's going to give me information up in this area of the graph. So that's, it will give us more information, but I'm not sure that that particular information will be more useful to our goal here. If I wanted a instantaneous velocity at three, that would be more useful. What if we move our t values a little bit closer? Wouldn't it be great if we could use from two to two? We will do that very soon, but we can't do that right now. We'd be divided by zero if you looked at our somewhere average rate. If b equals a, divide by zero. You'll get zero over zero. That's not terribly useful. So calculus is basically all about avoiding that problem. How do you deal with that? So we will get there. So let's do average rate of speed. I meant to compute this around t equals 1, not t equals 2. That's not good. I think things will work out a little bit better if we go around t equals 1. So I want t equals one average rate of speed, so let's do let's compute zero to one right now and get the slope from zero to one. I just don't I think the numbers will be way uglier around two than they will be around one. So we'll do go around one. So you should have gotten 16 as your slope. The computation is very easy on this one. Where does that come from? It is the slope between these two points right here, from 0, 0 to 116. And you can see that very easily on the board. Go over 1, go up 16, slope is 16. So now we'll properly draw out the slope of the actual point we want to compute at, right there. So now I can say it's between 16 and 40. Oh. Well, it's more than 16. And we'll figure out exactly what it will be. So you have to start at, well, I am telling you, you have to start at one second. What's a good time value to end at that gets us a better estimate for the slope here at one? So we did from one to two. We did that interval, one to two. If I'm telling you you have to start at one, 
what is a better t value to end at than 2? Well, I did that one already. I did 0 to 1, or 1 to 0. 1 to 3, that's going to give us a bigger, so if we look at that, that rate of change is going to look like this right here. You don't have to choose integers. Right, there's numbers between 1 and 2. So we could go 1.9, but that's super close to 2. Let's go a really small interval. So we'll start at 1, and let's go to 1.1. How about that? That's pretty small. We'll go from 1 to 1.1. And oop, 1.1. I think this is the reason I wanted to go 1 instead of going from 2 to 2.1. I think this, these computations are a little bit e nicer. All right, same thing you did before, except now we're going from 1 to 1.1. So here is where algebra can be better than arithmetic when you're computing. I'm going to factor the 16 out. Ready to change questions. I know I did some fancy arithmetic to avoid using a calculator. I did long do or what do they call it? Long multiplication, where you separate out each digit. So thirty three point six. That's pretty good. If I try to put this on the graph. It'll look like I actually have the right answer, or exactly what I want. So where's point one? Right about there. These two points are very close on this graph. Almost too close to even draw them on. So if I try to draw the rate of change, it looks like it's pretty close to the one I want. Not exactly, though. How do I get a better estimate? Remember, you can choose different t-values. What t-value should I stop at that would give me a better estimate? How do I move that second point closer? So I could go any number, one point something that's closer to one than what I just did. So we could do 1.05, let's get crazy, and let's go by a factor of 10. And instead of just cut it in half, we'll go divide it by 10. So compute this right here.
So arithmetic starts to suck a little bit because we have to square 101 basically instead of squaring 11. I can square 11, no problem. Squaring 101, that's more difficult. And I don't really see a way around this. So let's do some algebra instead. We're gonna turn our rate of change formula around a little bit. So we're gonna modify it. So we'll take an algebra break for a minute. Get away from numbers. So we did F, we'll go to X's. So an alternative form for this. So in the blue, I'm going to give these alternative names. So we'll call our initial, we'll just call it X. And our final, we'll call our final X1, X plus H. And what in the world is H? change markers. H is how far away from X that the final X value is. So I'm calling the initial X value, I'm just going to call it X, and the final X value, I'm going to call X plus H, or H is how much you moved from initial to final. And all we're going to do is rewrite our difference quotient Oh, did I say that word yet? This quarter? I said it a lot in pre-calculus class, pre-calculus one. This is called the difference quotient. Well, what we're about to write is the difference quotient. All right, x1 minus x0. x1 is x plus h minus x0 is x. f of x1 is f of x plus h minus f of x0 is just f of x. There's only one simplification I can make using algebra. What is that? No, I can't do anything with F. I don't know anything about that. Oh, that shouldn't be an X naught. What can I do in the denominator? No, just so I want to simplify here. What can I do with the X's in the denominator? Cancel them. X minus X cancels out. So this is our difference quotient right here. So this is an alternative form of the average rate of change. If you know how much you change between the two inputs, you can use this instead. Now we're going to compute the difference quotient. For x equal one and f of x equals 16x squared. So 16 input squared And I also want to simplify. So compute difference quotient and simplify. So foiling the x plus h squared. x squared plus xh plus xh, 2xh plus h squared minus 16x squared. divided by h. So I just foiled the x plus h minus 16x squared and plus 16x squared. So that's going to cancel out right there. So we got that 16x squared is going to cancel out with that positive 16x squared. And we're left with 1632 
xh plus 16 h squared divided by h. So I can definitely simplify some of these h out of here. How do I do that without making mistakes? If I'm really careful, I can cross some h's out. But what should I do? What algebraic move should I make first to be safe? Factor h out of the numerator. So I'm going to cancel the h in the numerator, but let's factor it first, and then we'll see it cancel a little bit more clearly. So we have 32x plus 16h divided by h. Now I can cancel our h very easily. So any questions on that factoring? We just see an x everywhere, or an h everywhere. I want to get rid of it. We have 32x plus 16h. So that seems like a lot of work. But what we have is a really nice formula. We know our x is 1, which I never actually plug that value in. So we'll plug in x equals 1 right now. I could have replaced x by 1 way earlier and just had a whole bunch of 1s running through here. So we'll plug in x equals 1 now. And we get our difference quotient is 32 times 1 plus 16h, or just 32 plus 16h. All right, so why is this very useful? Let's go back up to what we were doing, and let's use the difference quotient version instead. So it may seem like a lot of work. You're going to be doing plenty of algebra like this very soon. So this is just good algebra practice overall. So we got 32 plus 16h. So I just rewrote this in the form of x comma x plus h. So we're going from 1 to 1 plus 0 0.01. So our h is 0 0.01 now. So we're going from, on a number line, we're going from 1 to 1.01, 1 .01, where this is our x value right there. And the amount of difference between the two is h, or 0 0.01. So our x is 1 and h is 0 0.01. Using difference quotient. So we said 32, is it 32 plus 16h? I think that's what it was, 32 plus 16h. All right, all we're going to do, this is for when x is 1, I'm just going to plug in our h value 0 0.01. And we're going to very easily, very quickly, get the average rate of change. So we really wrote a function of h now. So there's the average rate of change written as a function of h. To give this function a better name. Let's just call it a, a of h. Ah. So a of 0 0.01 is 32 plus 16 times 0 0.01, which is 32 plus 0 0.16, 32.16. All right, we're getting. Our average speed is getting closer to 32. So maybe all this stuff doesn't work, and I'm just making it all up. Let's recheck our 33.6, see if it actually works up there. So let's go back a step. If I rewrite this, it goes from 1 to 1 plus 0.1 now. So our h is 0.1 in this example or in this uh, computation. So what is A of just 0.1 now? So that'll be 32 plus 16 times 0.1. 
16 times 0.1, 1.6, which is 33.6. And that's the same 33.6 we got. So let's get even crazier. Let's go, now we can do these quickly. We don't have to spend a lot of time computing, squaring, all that good stuff. So we simplified the form down really nicely. Now we're running out of room. Find average rate of change for t inside the interval 1 to 1.001. So H is even smaller now. Just got 10 times smaller. So compute A of 0 So now our paper has numbers and algebra all over it. Let's condense all this down into a nice table so we can see what's going on. So we did a whole lot of computations. Let's put them into a table. So no matter what, our x equals 1. And our, let me write that up higher. We started at 1, so we're choosing t values different t values and this is our average rate of change so we'll start with uh, t is 1 0 0.1 0 0.01 0 0.001 so our first average rate of change when t was 1 that was from 1 to 2 we got 48 I think somewhere 1 to 2, 48, yeah. And then we got 33.6, 32.16, 32 32.016. So there's our rates of changes. What if I went even further and did 0 .0001? Any guesses on our average rate of change? from our last computation. So we basically just add another zero in there. You can see it very easily happening right here. If I just put another zero in there, it'll just move the 0.16 over another decimal place. Once you have this chart set up, what would I get if I kept going and actually thought about putting in zero for t, which you're not allowed to do? But what if I did? What does this on the right side look like it's going to get closer to? 32.0. So that idea of, oh, well, if I let t keep going, I can never actually have t equals, oh, that's not t. What letter should be up in there? H. Those are h values. So I could look at the pattern. What would happen if h went towards 0? The answer is the rate of change would go towards 32. It's pretty convincing from this chart right here. What you can't actually do is let h equal 0. But you can ask the question, if h got closer and closer to 0, what would the other number get closer and closer to? So we can summarize that as h approaches 0 comma, rate of change, or A of H, it's a better way to write it, approaches 32. So as H approaches 0, A of H approaches 32. It took quite a while to come up with this chart. We had to use that difference quotient and simplify it down. So most of this comes down to some algebra tricks that there are not all that many. 
the algebra, algebra trick we just used was expand and cancel. And you'll be learning a few more. Well, they're algebra you've already done before.